good evening. It's good to see you guys tonight. I think we all really enjoyed um, this morning uh, seeing Don Iverson here with us and all the work that's going on overseas. It really seems to put us to shame with all the souls that are being uh, convicted of the gospel over there, but I think you said it right. It has a lot to do with the fertile soil over there. Um, a lot of distractions over here in America as to why we don't accept the gospel and why it doesn't spread as quickly. So we'll keep trying, but uh, keep supporting that great work over there. Tonight, uh, the title of my lesson is Dealing Correctly with the Silence of Scripture. Uh, you might remember what some have called the motto of Christ Church over the years is speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. Uh, we establish our religion, Christ's religion, by what is laid out plainly in Scripture. Uh, and by the way, we do have a handout tonight, uh, and we'll be looking at that. Not quite yet, but just a reminder. Um, tonight's lesson addresses a false teaching that uh, I came into contact with recently regarding this concept of silence of the Scripture. A man commented on one of Jake Burris' Facebook posts, uh, and he sent a YouTube video of a Church of Christ preacher who was promoting very liberal tendencies and practices. Uh, the preacher attends a congregation in Texas that has incorporated uh, instrumental music into their worship, as much of the denominations have done over the years, and praise teams of men and women up on stage and, and the whole nine yards. And in the video, this preacher was, uh, he gave an illustration I thought it would be really interesting for us to take a look at tonight. He gave, us an, he gave an illustration which was meant to show how uh, Christians who reject instruments in worship, right, instruments out of worship are not unauthorized, instruments inside worship are unauthorized. He says Christians who reject instruments in the worship are inconsistent in their logic. Say so it's not right uh, to reject that. I'd like to begin this lesson by sharing with you this illustration. And then I would like to ask you if his arguments have any truth to them. I want to put us to the test tonight. So uh, I'd like to see if you would know how to answer the arguments presented if someone was to use it with you. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, Peter wrote, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, set him apart in your hearts, and always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Uh, so if, if you believe something about Christ's religion that's written in Scripture and you practice certain things a certain way, uh, you better be able to give an answer scripturally based on why you do what you do in religion. To anyone who comes asking you or opposing what you stand for, you better be certain and be able to give an answer, give a defense. So this preacher, uh, he set up eight chairs in a line across the front of the stage. And it was a pretty big uh, stage, it had enough room for eight chairs. And for each uh, point that he began to make, he would sit down in one of these eight chairs, and he would talk from the perspective of the Church of Christ group, I guess you could say, or division, represented by each chair. He would bounce back and forth from one chair to the other, having a conversation with himself, and uh, it was to represent the arguments of each group represented. So he starts out by saying, he says, you see, the way that we in the church have typically read our Bible can only produce division and not unity. Let me show you through this illustration. So from the audience's point of view, the preacher uh, starts by standing next to the chair to the far left of the stage. And he says, this chair represents all members of the Church of Christ who worship with instruments. And by the way, he says, there are no liberals in our movement. There's nobody in the Christian church or the Church of Christ who denies the inspiration of the Scripture, the deity of Christ, His virgin birth, His bodily resurrection, or His full su sufficiency and atonement. Right? He says, nobody denies those things. But he says, this guy here in chair number one, he worships with instruments. And I didn't grow up in that church, he said. I go to this church. And he sits down in chair number two. I don't worship with instruments. And so according to silence, the silence of the scriptures, 
I say to my brother here in chair number one, you know, I love you, but you're my erring brother because you don't accept the authority of the Scripture. You can't show me in your New Testament where you have permission to use instruments. And so I'm sorry, but I can't have fellowship with you until you give up your instrument. And then I can have fellowship with you. All right, so we can have unity if you'll just give up your innovation. The preacher pauses for a moment, expressing his disapproval of this thinking, and he says, you see, this is how we in the Church of Christ have tried to find unity in the past. You give up what I don't approve of, and we'll have unity. But let's see how this works with my friend over here in chair number three. The preacher gets up and sits down in chair number three. And he starts talking to chair number two. He says, you know, I'm sure glad that you told our erring brother in chair number one that we can't fellowship with him. Because instrumental music certainly is not found anywhere in the New Testament. But you know, I've been thinking. You worship at a congregation with praise teams. And I don't read anywhere or anything in my New Testament about men and women leading the singing with a praise team. Therefore, I can't have fellowship with you until you give up your innovation. If you'll give up what I don't agree with, then I'll be able to fellowship with you. And we'll be on the same page. The preacher gets up, sits down in chair number four. Hello, brother, he says to chair number three. I couldn't help but overhearing. Yes, we cannot have fellowship with these two brothers because they have added instrumental music and praise teams to their worship. But I can't help but notice that there is something you do at your congregation that I don't read of in my Bible. You see, you meet for Bible classes at your congregation. And don't you know that it's not found anywhere in the New Testament where a congregation divided into Bible classes when they met together? Can't point to it in Scripture. But there's no authority anywhere in the New Testament for Bible classes of breaking into different groups. Therefore, chair number four says to number three, I can't have fellowship with you. I can't have fellowship with you until you give up your innovation. Then we can have fellowship. The preacher gets up and sits down in chair number five. Hello, brother. He says to chair number four, I'm glad to see you've been standing for truth against brothers one, two, and three. We can't fellowship with them because they have added instrumental music, praise teams, and Bible classes to the New Testament pattern. And until they give up those things, we certainly cannot have fellowship with them. But you see, the preacher says, I noticed that you, in chair number four, are also practicing something at your congregation that I don't read of in my Bible. Your congregation supports orphan homes with the money from the church treasury. I don't read anywhere in my New Testament about a group of Christians using the Lord's money to support orphans' homes. There's no authority. Therefore, I cannot have fellowship with you until you give up your innovation. The preacher stands up and sits down in chair number six. Hello, brother, he says to chair number five. I'm glad to see you've been standing for truth against our erring brothers in chairs number one, two, three, and four. And we can't fellowship with them until they give up their instrumental music, their praise teams, their Bible classes, and supporting of orphan homes. But you know what else isn't found in the New Testament? When I attended worship with you, you passed around multiple cups during communion. I don't read anywhere in my New Testament where Christians use multiple cups for communion. My Bible says the Lord took the cup and they drank from it. Therefore, I cannot have fellowship with you until you give up your innovation, your change. The preacher stands up and sits down in chair number seven. And what problem does chair number seven have with chair number six? He says... 
I see at your congregation, you are also doing something that the New Testament has not authorized. You are supporting a preacher with money from the church treasury. I don't know about you, but I don't read about a located preacher at a congregation being supported financially in the New Testament. Therefore, I cannot have fellowship with you until you give up what I don't agree with. The preacher pauses here. He says, folks, and by the way, the, the audience has been laughing uh, at everything he's been saying because they're getting a kick out of it. He says, folks, I, I know this seems silly, but our movement has split over every single chair. Over every single chair, he said. And we've got one more chair. Chair number eight. We could have a bunch more chairs, he says. This chair represents a Christian who won't fellowship brother in chair number seven because he meets in a church building. Show me in the New Testament authority for a church building. The same person who says that for several hundred years the church never used instruments is the same brother liable to charge, yes, but for several hundred years the church never had buildings. They met in homes. And if one is necessary, then why isn't the other? The preacher goes on to conclude with these remarks. He says, the truth is, here's his conclusion, our motto has been in the Church of Christ, where the Bible speaks, we speak, and where the Bible is silent, we're silent. But that's not true. Our real motto is, where the Bible speaks, we speak, and where the Bible is silent, we have a whole lot more to say. We say a lot where the Bible is silent. And he concludes, is unity only to be achieved by surrendering to the conclusions of the most narrow-minded of us? And he points to chair number eight. And by the way, that's actually where the video cut out. It's uh, all I really got of, of his sermon, but I think we understand what he's getting at. So that was the preacher's argument in this illustration up on stage. And I just ask you tonight to think about this. Uh, did you notice what this man was trying to do? To make opposition to instrumental music look really silly. I think we noticed what he was trying to do uh, in his argument. He was trying to point out several illogical doctrines that he knows his audience would agree are illogical. And he says... That's the way it is with your argument regarding instrumental music. All right, if we could place the Davison Church of Christ up here on one of these eight chairs, what chair would we be in? I put us in chair number three. And isn't that right? Uh, we oppose instrumental music and praise teams, but we do not oppose Bible classes, supporting orphan homes, using multiple cups, supporting a preacher, or meeting in a building. And what this preacher is trying to do is appeal to our feelings in the church about these other topics because we know right well how silly these other arguments are that a very small portion of the brotherhood, of the brotherhood hold to in binding things which they ought not to bind from Scripture. So the preacher's argument is, you know, your logic really is the same as the one cup Church of Christ. Those people who bind that you have to pass around one cup or else you're sinning. Your logic is the same as those groups who oppose orphans' home and eating in the church building. You're that group. So don't you know that when you oppose instrumental music, you are using the same erroneous argument as them? Furthermore, if you argue that instruments are wrong because you can't read about them in the New Testament, you are inconsistent and in that you don't condemn all these other things because they aren't written about in the New Testament either, and yet you accept those things anyway. You're inconsistent. So what I want to prove tonight, with the remainder of our lesson, uh, is that opposing instrumental music is not the same erroneous argument that some of these brothers make regarding chairs three through seven. And it is not inconsistent of us to accept all of these other things while rejecting instrumental music and praise teams. That's what I want to talk about tonight. It's not inconsistent. Very quickly, before we begin to answer these claims, I do want to note two errors that this preacher had in his arguments. 
and that, that they really kind of bothered me the way he presented this this and it was deceptive it was a I think a good illustration to to trick people number one this preacher is actually practicing a common technique that is used in debates known as gish galloping I had to go look up what the technique was, but I knew it was a debate technique. Listen to how Wikipedia defines this common debate tactic. It says, during a, get, a gish gallop, a debater confronts an opponent with a rapid series of many inaccurate arguments, half-truths, and misrepresentations in a short space of time which makes it impossible for the opponent to refute all of them within the format of a formal debate. Think about that phrase, inaccurate arguments, half-truths, misrepresentations in a short span of time. All right, this tactic involves firing off many different claims quickly in an attempt to overwhelm the opponent's response, and that's just what this preacher did. All right, so don't be fooled by all of this thrown at you at once. He said, hey, you can't oppose instrumental music because if you do, You'll also be opposing Bible class, supporting orphans' homes, using multiple cups and communion, supporting a preacher, and meeting in a church building. He throws all those things at you at one time. Because that's the natural end to your logic. You would have to give up everything in your religion that isn't specifically mentioned in Scripture if you're trying to be consistent with your logic. So his argument leaves us saying, all right, wow. All right, how do I answer all of these claims? Where do I begin? Where do I start? And in order to answer the full argument, you would have to take the time to go through each one of these claims, one by one, and discuss why each point is not the same logic as opposing instrumental music. And, but you see, he's not interested in hearing your answer. He's interested in trying to give you so much to think about so that you can't answer. And try to, trying to make a Christian look silly. Sometimes atheists have used this debate tactic when they're in public debates with Christians. Uh, when trying to disprove the Bible, they'll list off a stream of, of 30 passages of the Bible that are alleged Bible contradictions. And they'll say, this, this one's a contradiction, this one, this one, this one, this one, and they give a list. But they know very well that their opponent is not going to have time to answer all 30 passages, and that's called gish galloping. Okay. Number two, another error that this preacher is also guilty of is trying to, I think Lorraine will like this one because she's a math teacher. This teacher is combining unlike terms. Combining unlike like terms. That is, he's, com he's comparing, he's not comparing apples to apples here. But he's comparing concepts that actually are unrelated to one another trying to fit them into the, to, to the one in the same category, when in reality, they don't belong together in the same discussion. People uh, of the world, they'll try to do this today uh, when they fight against homosexuality as being a sin. Right? We stand up and say, homosexuality is a sin. We can't support it. Have you ever heard this argument? They'll say, oh, you know, back in the 1950s and 60s, America had the civil rights movement where blacks uh, gain rights in this country and they could vote and, and they were pushing these things and that was great, wasn't it? And they said, yeah, that was great. And then there was the women's rights movement where women gain more rights in this country. And then they say, and now today we're having the gay rights movements. And we need to give gay couples the same rights and privileges as married straight couples and we need to promote these things and say these things are okay. It's okay to live in marriage with same-sex marriages. Therefore, if you thought what was happening in uh, the 1950s and 60s was right, then you also need to stand behind the gay rights movement. And we have to say as Christians, hold on, listen. For black people to not be segregated and to be able to vote and for women to be able to cast a vote in this country, right? Those things are not sinful things to stand for, right? Probably just the opposite. Uh, but to stand for homosexuals, being able to live in a marriage and stand for uh, promoting that concept, that is sinful. And so you see in their error, they are combining three concepts together and they try to make a point 
when you never really should put those three movements into the same category because one is sin and two of them are not. Okay? So with regards to our illustration tonight, in the last third of this lesson, I will explain uh, why putting those eight chairs into the same category across the stage really is like comparing apples to oranges. They're, these, these don't go on the same stage. And really, uh, the only thing that they have in common is that they've divided the church. But that's it. So let me give you three points uh, from which we will work through for the rest of this lesson. Uh, I want to note, number one, we do have God's authority for items three through seven. Plain and simple. We have God's authority for every item on that list, three through seven. But we certainly do not have God's authority for items one and two. The only thing about these concepts that they have in common is that they have divided the church into different groups. But they have not divided the church by the same logic or reasoning, right, as, as, they, as this preacher supposes. You know, a great verse, if we get into some Bible verses uh, about authority, is Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. Paul says, whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And remember, to do something in the name of Jesus is to do it by his authority. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So this scripture says, if you do anything in this life, you must have Christ's authority to do that thing. And someone says, well, how is that possible? You know, for example, how am I supposed to drive a car by the authority of Jesus Christ? How am I supposed to play basketball in my free time? By the authority of Jesus Christ. This verse says, do every, everything you ever do, you do it by the authority of Jesus Christ. But you say, these things aren't written about in the New Testament. They aren't specifically mentioned. Well, not everything in this life must be specifically mentioned in Scripture in order for us to have Christ's authority to do it. You know, uh, we know that we're free to drive a car and we're free to play basketball in our free time because those things do not violate any biblical principle or command elsewhere. These do not violate. So it does not conflict with obedience to God. Therefore, it's not sinful. We have a freedom in, in, in these things. So we do have Christ's authority because it's not uh, forbidden. It does, well, it does not conflict with anything else, any principle in Scripture. So in that regard, the scripture is silent on these things. Right? But we do have authority even though they're silent. God gives us freedom. But of course, if I wish to drive my car 120 miles per hour down the highway, I do not have Christ's authority for that. Why not? Because it conflicts with something else in scripture. The Bible specifies that we must obey the laws of the land. Romans chapter 3, 13, verse 1 and 2. So I do not have Christ's authority for that action because it conflicts with obedience to God in another area of Scripture. Also, I do not have Christ's authority to play basketball while missing church on Sunday. Why? Because Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says not to forsake the assembling. Right? So the Bible says you have to have God's authority for every single action that you choose to participate in this life. Everything. Whatever you do, make sure you have authority for it. So uh, when it comes to authority in religion, uh, we must look to God's authority of the New Testament for how we are to operate in the church versus how we operate as individuals in society. For example, although it does not conflict with Christ's authority to play basketball in our free time, it certainly conflicts with Christ's authority to bring basketball into our assembly and to try to implement it as a sixth act of worship, right? I always joke about this and use it as an illustration. You know, let's say, you know, hey, we can put up a basketball hoop right over here on the wall. We're going to stick it up there. And right after the Lord's Supper, we're all going to line up and we're going to shoot hoops for Jesus as a sixth act of worship. Is that okay to do? The Bible doesn't say we can't. Well, you understand it. It specifies what we're to do in worship. And we know there's no authority for that because it conflicts with the pattern for how we're to worship. Part of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, is that when we worship, we must worship in truth. 
You have to do it according to truth, which means according to how God told you to do it. Right? You remember in the Old Testament when Nadab and Abihu went against God's authority in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. And they uh, worshipped, and they offered something as worship, which God had not commanded them. God specified this. He gave, they gave him something else. And fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord because they went against what God had specified. So we learn that when God leaves specifications, we follow them. And where God does not leave specifications, when he's general and generic, then we have freedom. Point number two, this is where we must understand the difference, and you'll recognize this word, between expedience, expediency and disobedience. Expediency versus disobedience. So uh, to use an expediency does not violate an expectation or a command from God. And this goes along with the chart that you have. Uh, so let me give you the, the, the definition for both of these terms. Disobedience is violating a command of God. Expediency will define it as accomplishing God's command in a convenient way. So note that expediency does not violate the command or the expectation from God, but it is simply a means of getting the job done. So obedience still takes place. Let's read through a few of these items on your handout. I won't be able to get through all of them, but maybe it can be a helpful tool if you read through this in your own time. But let's see what we find here. First, just to illustrate this principle, God gave Noah the command and the expectation to make an ark out of gopher wood, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 14. Very specific. In that inherent command, God was specific on the type of wood that Noah was to use, but he was generic in Noah's method of building the ark. Okay, therefore, although God did not say, build an ark of gopher wood using a hammer, God, or Noah was free to use an aid if he so cho chose to. Someone says, but God never told Noah he could use a hammer. I don't see a statement where God said, build a hammer using, uh, or, or sorry, build an ark of gopher wood using a hammer. God never said that. We see God didn't specify any tool that was to be used in the construction of the ark. So where God did not specify, Noah had freedom. Right? Uh, when God leaves specifications, we follow them. Where God is generic, we have freedom. Noah was free to use a hammer, even though God didn't specifically mention it. Second, 2 Kings chapter 5, uh, God gives two commands to Naaman, spoken through the prophet Elisha. He says, I want you to go and I want you to dip seven times in the Jordan River. That's pretty straightforward. I want you to notice that God was generic in the command to go. Therefore, uh, Naaman could have walked he could have rode in a chariot. He could have gone on a donkey. And, you know, basically, however you've got to get there, go. But God was very specific in the second part of the command. I want you to go, and I want you to dip in the Jordan River seven times. So God said for the first part of the command, get to the Jordan River. I don't care how you get there. I'll leave it up to you. Right? But when you arrive, I have very specific instructions on what I want you to do when you get there. So disobedience would have come if Naaman, for example, would have gone to a different river. He specified, I want you to go to the, the, uh, or the Jordan River. Or if he would have tried to uh, change the number of times that he dipped. Right? Elisha told him to dip seven times. What if he only dipped three times in the Jordan River? Would that have cut it? Would that have been obeying the commands of God? What if instead of Naaman dipping seven times, uh, that he was sprinkled seven times? I think that would be a good comparison for how some people try to do baptism today. Uh, so do you suppose it would have worked? No. Right? Where God leaves specifications, we must follow them. But where God is generic, we have freedom. So uh, this is not only a simple concept to understand, it is also common sense. Next, skip down to item four on your list. Acts chapter 10 and verse 47, God commanded sinners to be baptized in water. Now first, I want you to notice what God did not specify. God did not say, I want you to be baptized in the waters of a river. God didn't say that. 
right? Specifically, you, it must be in a river that you get baptized. And the Bible doesn't specify that. Therefore, even though we do not read anything in the Bible about a baptistry, for example, in a building, uh, which is an indoor pool of water used for baptizing, we do have freedom to implement and aid something that would be easier for us. And there's no problem with that. You're not violating anything. It's expediency. All right, so God commands, uh, God com God's command specifies, you immerse them, you do it in water. And based off that command, we see that God could care less if you immerse somebody in a river, in a pool, in a baptistry, in a hot tub. Right? You just find water and you immerse them in that water. So we do not bind what God has not bound. You see an example in Acts chapter 8 of someone being baptized in a river, but that is not a, a, a binding circumstance. He, he commanded immerse in water. He did it in a river. I could do it in a river. I could do it in a baptistry. The question is, what things has God specified, and in what things is God generic in what he asks? So in that sense, we speak where the Bible speaks. And we are silent where the Bible is silent. We bind what must be bound, and we give freedom where God has given freedom. Now, if you skip down to number five on our list, uh, we'll talk about God's specification for New Testament worship in the church. Of course, we know it is different from the specification in the Old Testament. But Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 19 specifies very clearly, and this is one passage uh, that states this, you can break down the specification of music in the Lord's church with these two commands. Sing and make melody in your heart. I want you to sing. I want you to make melody in your heart. More specifically, the, the original language carries with it the idea of making melody actually with your heart. Uh, the Greek word solo means to pluck or to play. And it, this is actually a literary allusion to what is done when you play an instrument. Uh, whereas Psalm chapter 33 and verse 2 in the Old Testament specifies that I want you to make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. And the New Testament specifies I want you to make melody to him with your heart. So the idea in the original language of the New Testament is, hey, Christians, I want you to sing and I want you to pluck your heart strings. That's the play on words that he's asking us. I want you to sing and make melody with your heart. So what we're told to do, vocal music. Vocal music with chords struck in the heart. That's our specification. So where God has specified, we must bind like any other command or instruction. So we have to bind this. It must be bound because Scripture bound it. So our motto comes into play here. we got to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. But we have to understand, the Bible's not silent here. The Bible is not silent about music and worship. It told us exactly what to do in the subject of music in the church. So uh, we must oppose, we have to oppose anything that violates what God has specified. God specified in uh, singing. A great illustration to compare to this concept uh, is how you know, members of the, I guess you'd say the liberal Church of Christ, uh, will point out that sprinkling and pouring are not acceptable forms of baptism, and correctly so, right? They'll say correctly, no, this can't, this isn't acceptable because the Bible specifies immersion in Scripture. It specifies. But you see, the New Testament never specifically forbids sprinkling or pouring for baptism. It only specifies what you're supposed to do. It specifies immersion. Well, you know, it's the same thing with our command to sing in the church. The Bible uh, never specifically forbids instruments in the Lord's church. It, spe it just specifies over and over and over again, I want you to sing. I want you to sing. Never mentions instrumental music. Point number three of this lesson, uh, I ask you with each action that you do in the church, are you violating a biblical command or are you using expediency? Are you violating a command or are you using expediency? So when you bring instruments into the church, here's what we have to understand. You violate a direct command from the New Testament. 
You are not simply practicing something convenient, but you are doing something that is in violation. When you implement praise teams, chair number two, praise teams of men and women standing up on the stage, you are violating 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, where the women are commanded to be silent and to not have authority over the men in the assembly. But all these other items that are mentioned, all these other items mentioned where some members of the Church of Christ bind these restrictions do not violate anything in the New Testament. There's no violation here. If you look at items 3 through six, three through 7 on this list again, you'll notice that each item is connected with a generic command of the New Testament and not a specific command, which is restrictive. Okay, chair number 3, if we go through this list very quickly, is connected with the generic command to teach and instruct the brethren. Teach and instruct the brethren, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 11. That's a generic command. I want you to instruct them. There is never a binding statement that restricts all teaching to one man preaching alone before the group, as I am doing with you now. Right? In fact, many times in Scripture, we read about private Bible discussions outside of the group setting. Therefore, there is nothing wrong with dividing into smaller groups as long as the church is still coming together for the obligation of assembling on the first day of the week. Right? We can meet on a Friday and, and meet into separate groups. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not violating anything. Therefore, because the Bible is not specific, we have room for expediency. Chair number four. I simply note about this topic that Scripture does not specify exactly what we are to do with the Lord's money from the church treasury. It's, it's generic with a lot of what we're to do with it. So we, we do see a few examples in guiding principles, and there are certainly things that would not be smart to use the Lord's money for, but there's really no binding statement that specifies exactly what it is to be used for. And actually, uh, in, in today's lesson with, with Don, I had this lesson in mind, and I was specifically jotting things down that they use the money for which I said, you know, that's, there's nowhere specified in Scripture, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the list. There's nowhere specified in Scripture that you can buy somebody a prosthetic leg or a front door to a church building or a motorcycle or a motor tricycle and how he bought, you know, they used the church's money for good. And so, uh, therefore, we conclude that it is a judgment call to be made by each congregation with how the Lord's money is used. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. Let us do good. James chapter 1 and verse 27 commands us to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. All right. uh, therefore, if, there, if these groups, such as widows and orphans, are in need, there is no other binding statement in Scripture forbidding us or deterring us from aiding them financially. Let us do good to all men. And if that so happens to be money in their pocket, we should do it. And that, as we saw this morning, that ends up converting a lot of people. Uh, we, we start with the physical, we get to the spiritual, get to talking to them, and they can become Christians. Number five. Chair number five is uh, connected with our command to eat the bread and drink the cup. Right? And we are to do this until the Lord comes back. So Jesus, nor any other in the New Testament, ever specified that we must drink the fruit of the vine out of one cup. He just simply said, you must drink the fruit of the vine. Jesus just so happened to use one cup. right? But that is not a binding detail. We mentioned uh, that just because the eunuch was baptized, just so happened to be baptized in a river, doesn't mean we have to be baptized in a river. We just have to be baptized in water because that's what the Bible specified. And in fact, in Luke chapter 22 and verse 17, even when G Jesus implemented the Lord's Supper, Jesus did say, divide it amongst yourself. Now, what if that is a congregation of 150 people, right? And it's not the cup that we're drinking. It's the, con the, the item inside the cup that we're drinking that we're to divide amongst ourselves. Chair number six, uh, supporting a preacher. And actually, I, I really don't think this one belongs up here at all because uh, first, because <laughs> I'm a preacher. <laughs> first Corinthians chapter nine, uh, where Paul says about this subject, a laborer is worthy of his wages, uh, and this is in direct 
you know, a conflict with, with what the Bible says. Chair number seven, um, meeting in a church building. Should we not be here tonight? Should we be in a house? Uh, this goes along with our command, the generic command, assemble. Assemble, gather together, and it does not specify that we have to meet in a certain place, uh, that you have to meet in a house, or you got to be in this place or that place. It's a generic <coughs> statement. I want you to gather together. So that's as far as we'll go tonight uh, with that concept. So let us just deal correctly with where the Bible actually speaks and where the Bible actually does not speak. And if we're talking about instrumental music, we talked about the Bible does speak there. And so let us not bind what Scripture has not bound, but let us be sure to bind what Scripture does bind. If you're not a Christian tonight, here is how the Bible uh, tells us we have to get to heaven. You've got to be a follower of Jesus Christ and obey His gospel. And you have to hear that message, that Jesus Christ was a member of the Godhead who came down from heaven to earth, uh, lived in a human body for 33 years and died on a cross. That way you can make atonement available for sinners of this world. So if you'll hear that message and believe it, and if you will repent of your sins, having a change of mind about the sins and walking in a different direction, if you will confess Him before men, I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if you will be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you can come up a new creature, washed from your sins and cleansed, immersed, and you have a condition of remaining faithful until death as members of the Lord's church. So if anybody uh, would like to do that tonight, the water is ready. And uh, if any Christians would like to come forward for prayers or repentance, uh, they can do that as we stand and as we sing. Jesus is calling, calling, calling. Jesus.